It's a little humid out, huh? Good gracious. <laughs> well, it actually fits for today's message. Did you know that the Bible says that we see through a glass darkly or dimly? Did any of you have those windows where you woke up this morning? I don't know if you'd say dimly, but fuzzily? Is that a word? Like, well, today we're going to be talking a little bit about a lifestyle of faith. Um, so if you have a Bible, I want to ask you to take it out, a device to access the scriptures, and turn to two passages, if possible. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Pop quiz, Old or New Testament? Yeah. Good. Seems so enthusiastic about that. <laughs> 2 Corinthians 5. And then Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11 will be the two places in God's Word where we'll spend most of our time this morning. Um, but as has been mentioned through, through video, through other announcements today, we're in a, a teaching series that we've entitled Summer at Coastline. And summer is such a, a fun and a full time if you live in this area year round or if you're just here for the summer. I mean, we have programs going on all throughout our community and our church. We just, as you guys saw, a little bit of a taste of, had a wonderful week of VBS. Um, we're preparing for a, a week with our junior high students where they go out throughout the community and serve in practical ways all throughout this area. The high school ministry is planning for a week of mission in the, in the state of Georgia by partnering with a small church plant there and then attending a, a summer youth camp. Um, you just heard about Windshape where we'll have hundreds of kids on campus this summer hearing the good news about Jesus, learning some life skills and just having a blast. And then also the baptism at the end of this month. It's a full summer of events and opportunities to connect and see our kids poured into and trained and given a clear exposure to the good news of Jesus. And the beaches are full. Now, I don't know what this, um, well, how this information makes you feel, but I, at the very least, I found it interesting. I'm told that last Saturday, the Bob Sykes Toll Plaza recorded 23,543 vehicles going through that toll plaza, which makes it Overcrowded is what makes it. <laughs> is which makes it like the, the largest amount ever that have gone through that toll on a day at the beach. The beaches are full and the storms. I mean, did you, I don't know if you saw this photo online. It was kind of circulating like, it's been a powerful week of weather. Um, a lot goes on during the summer here at Coastline. So much goes on. And with all of this, I think it's going to be a blast to welcome some good friends to open God's word to us over this next month. Now, in this series, each speaker will be bringing kind of a special message from God's word. You say, what does that mean? Well, if you're new to our church or maybe familiar with Calvary Chapel, you're, you're probably pretty familiar with our MO on a Sunday morning, just walking through books of the Bible, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, doing it in a way that seeks not to read our meaning into the text, but just to present the text and allow it to give us its meaning and application. That's our rhythm. We've been walking through the book of Revelation this year, and we plan to step back into that book after this summer. But for the summer... We won't be giving messages through a book of the Bible or a themed series, but a message that God has placed on these individuals' hearts who serve our local area. And when we end the summer, we plan to bring Pastor David Guzik in in September, who's just a gift to the church. I mean, to our church, yes, but to the church. He has a wonderful free commentary entitled Enduring Word. And he's going to be here for an Enduring Word weekend in which he kind of takes time on a Friday night, a Saturday morning, and on a Sunday to give us an overview of end times and what God plans to do to bring righteousness, truth, and judgment and His grace to this world. And this morning, I'm honored to be able to share with you. And as we get into the study of God's Word, I simply want to ask this question. I feel compelled to ask this question. And I've got to be honest with you. I wrestled a lot with this message. I think I wrote four different messages for this Sunday and finally landed on this one. 
My dad would come in throughout the week because it's not through a book of the Bible, so you have this opportunity to go, well, Lord, what do you want for this Sunday? So what are you teaching on this Sunday? And he all said, well, I think I've got a message on parenting. Sounds great. And come back, I think I've got a message on marriage. Sounds great. Where I landed this morning was a message on the lifestyle of faith. And I feel compelled to ask this question. Do you ever struggle? That's a good question, but that's not my question. Do you ever struggle with hearing the voice of God? Maybe not knowing what to do. Maybe wondering the right decision to make, the right path to take. Anyone ever struggled with that once or twice in your life? Can't wait to talk to the people in the back. <laughs> you guys have got it. Well, I want to say this first. I'm reminded of the simple truth of God's word that comes from the book of James chapter one. I didn't ask you to turn there. You can if you like, but I want to read this to you because I love the simplicity of this. If any of you lack wisdom, that a mask of God, who gives generously to all without reproach and will be given. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. That person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. A double-minded man and stable in all his ways. I love how clear that is, how direct that is. Are you struggling to hear from God, to know his word, to know his wisdom? Just simply ask. Ask him. But be ready for his answer. If I were to put that in the NIV, Neil's interesting version, that's what I see there. Struggling with wisdom? Ask of God. He's not against you. He's for you. But with what he shares, settle in your heart. Settle in your head, settle it with your hands, that what you say is what I say. What you call me to do, that's what I do. That's the one who hears from God. The one who says, Lord, my life is forfeit. It's a blank canvas for you to do whatever you want to do. Like that song that the kids sang this morning. My life is your workmanship. You write whatever story you want to write. You do whatever you want to do. Because Christianity, in its truest form, is simply God showing off throughout your life. Him saving you, redeeming you, giving new life to you, and then giving gifts and talents and abilities to build up others and to live for His glory. It's God in you. That's your hope of glory. Him working through you. You finally recognizing that you are created. He is creator. And life's purpose, life's passions, life's joys are found in right relationship with him. Let me ask you a question. For some reason, I feel compelled to ask this. Do you ever struggle hearing from God? Well, this morning, I believe through 2 Corinthians 5, through Hebrews chapter 11, that we'll see that it's in a lifestyle of faith that life's purpose is finally fulfilled. You simply trust him. Now, I would say this. In some ways, in many ways, hearing God speak is extremely simple. So what do you mean by that? It begins and it grows in a relationship with Jesus. Let me read to you 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. This is Paul writing to a young leader, a young pastor. He says this, There is one God and one mediator who can reconcile God and humanity. Does anyone know his name? Yes, Jesus. Jesus Christ. That's the one. And he gave his life to what? I like what the New Living Translation says, to purchase freedom for everyone. Ah, so life in Christ is freedom. It's not bondage. It's not a rule book to follow and find out the things that you don't and can't and shouldn't do. Oh, it has those things. But you've heard me say this many times. 
Sin is not bad because it's forbidden. It's forbidden because it's bad. Like God's word will highlight those things that, no, don't do this. Why? Because it will destroy you. But it's meta narrative. The theme of this book is that God loves you. He's made a way for you to have a right relationship with God. And you know what it looks like? It looks like freedom. Freedom. That's what it looks like. See, hearing from God in many ways is simple. It's about Jesus. Secondarily, having God's word. I love this, that you can have confidence that you're hearing from God when you're in his word. His word being understood and applied rightly. I heard one person saying this, complaining about a silent God while your Bible is closed is like complaining about not getting a message or text when your phone is turned off. Like you want to hear from God, open up his word. Open up his word. That's where he speaks. Don't you wish there was a church that helped you daily get into God's word? <laughs> Man, just get into da daily, be in his word. Daily, be people of the book. It's a relationship with Jesus. It's knowledge of his word. And this is something he's been showing me throughout my four decades of life. God gives people into your life people. In Exodus chapter 20, listen to some of the first people he gives to many of us. Honor your father and your mother. Then you will live a long and full life in the land the Lord God has given you. Listen, we live in a world with increasingly more broken images of what family is designed to be. It's ever so more important for us to be Christians that know this book because you're presented with so many other messages that would say, this is good news, this is good news, this is good news. And I understand that when you hear the word father for some of us, mother for some of us, that doesn't bring joy to our hearts, but sadness and sorrow and pain or numbness. I can understand that. We live in a world with broken images of family, but God's intention is that mom and dad would be there to love, to lead, and to launch you into life. That's the purpose of a parent. Not to entertain, but to train. Not to just allow, but to love. And not to just hope that things, but to see you launched well. And the Bible says, Exodus 20, God's given mom and dad, why? Honor them, obey them, especially if you're under their roof. Why? Because God wants to use them so that your life would be lived well. God gives us his word. We have a relationship with his son, but he gives us people. Ephesians chapter four, the New Living Translation says this, these are the gifts Christ gave to the church. And he begins to list people, the apostles, the prophets, evangelists, the pastors, the teachers, their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. People. Romans 13.1 says, Everyone must submit to governing authorities, for all authority comes from God. And those in positions of authority have been placed there by God. Why do I say this? Why do I share this? Well, because having a relationship with God being submitted to his word, benefiting from the leadership that God brings into your life. Listen, let me have your attention. These are tried and true avenues of the counsel of God. If you wonder, well, how can I have, how can God speak? I can't hear. Do you know Jesus? Are you in his word? And what's your relationship like with authority? One person once told me, Neil, if you have a problem with authority, you ultimately have a problem with God. Because God is the one over every bit of authority. Trust him. He is working his will in his way. And his greatest desire for my life and yours is not necessarily my comfort, but developing my character. Seeing me grow. Seeing me develop seeing you and I bear fruit. See, in some ways it's very clear, hearing God speak, it's in his word. 
What's God doing with those involved in your life that are in some element of leadership? But even still, and I want to say this, there's a bit of mystery to it. How can we position ourselves to be in a place where we're hearing God speak? Well, 2 Corinthians 5, if you're there, let me know by saying, Jesus loves me. That's very true. Let's read 2 Corinthians 5, verses 1 through 10. I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation. This is what Paul writes. He says, For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent, this body we're in presently, we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. If indeed by putting it on, we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan being burdened. Not that we'd be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. For he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us his spirit as a guarantee. So we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, We're of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we're at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. There's a lot of text in that passage, a lot to unpack. Paul is addressing the the Christians in Corinth, But there's two massive concepts that he's writing about in this text that I want you to grasp this morning. Verses one through nine, Paul is enraptured with the hope of heaven. He says, listen, I'm in this earthly tent, this earthly dwelling, but I am yearning for, groaning for, hoping for that day where sin will be done away with. My perspective, my gaze, my focus, my hope is heaven. And then in verse 10, he's reminding himself and those he's writing to that there is this thing called the judgment seat of Christ. The judgment seat of Christ. Say, what is that? That, my dear friends, is the reward ceremony for believers that time where they receive what God has given to them, like it says in that passage, for their life. What do you mean you gotta earn? No, not earning salvation. But this concept that heaven is secure because of what Jesus has done and that also what you do today matters. But how you're living, that's what I'm, I'm all about. See, the hope of heaven is Paul's focus being set on the eternal. So when he wakes up in the morning, when he's walking through his afternoon, as he's rounding out his evening, his head is in heaven. And the judgment seat of Christ, Paul knew that his life was like a race. It was a battle. It was a fight. See, Paul knew that at the race's end, there would be a finish line and a reward, which is always interesting when there's a race and at the end there's like Krispy Kreme or something like that. I don't think that's what he's mentioning here, but I'm not anti that. I just always find that interesting. But anyway, that also there's spoils of battle that go to a victor and that there's a belt to wear, so to speak, for the fighter, right? Like there's purpose to what God's doing. Paul viewed his world, his life, and every step he took, listen, through these two filters, there's heaven and there's reward. There's heaven And there's reward. That's why he would make statements to younger guys that he would be bringing up, like in 2 Timothy 4. He would say this, I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I've fought the good fight. I finished the race. I kept the faith. Do you see that mindset of the Apostle Paul? In 1 Corinthians 9, he would say this, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize. So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, a crown, but we an imperishable one. So I do not run aimlessly. 
I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body. I keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Paul had this perspective on life, that it was a race, that there's a fight, that there's a journey, that there's this hope of heaven and rewards. I mean, when he's writing to Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter two, he says this, you therefore must endure hardship like a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Verse five, he says, and so if anyone completes in athletics, he's not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. He's saying, Timothy, life's like being a soldier. It's like being an athlete. In verse six, he says, it's like being a farmer, being the first to take of the crops. He says, consider what I say, and may the Lord give you understanding in all things. The farmer. My, my girls were telling me a little bit about a couple of families in the church that just planted a papaya tree. Anyone ever eaten papaya? Do you actually enjoy it? Yes. Man, we, we didn't enjoy it, but that's good for you. I'm, like when we ate it, we were like, oh, okay, well, that's awesome. But like when you plant the seed, it's not like the next day you're eating papaya or complaining about papaya. The papaya takes time. You plant the seed in long, long, long waits, watching nothing happen until finally you can eat that bitter fruit called papaya. What's the point? A farmer keeps showing up, just keeps doing the right thing, just doing what he knows to do when he doesn't know what to do. There is a strong principle in that in following Jesus. God, you've given me your word. You've given me a relationship with you because of your son. You've placed leaders in my life. I know so much of what you've called me to do. And so when I don't know what to do, like a farmer, I'm gonna do what I know to do. I'm gonna stick with you and stay with you and see life through this filter and through this frame that there is heaven and there is a reward. And Paul gives these illustrations. He says, you know what? Like a soldier, he fights to please his commanding officer. Like an athlete, he, he finds the rules and he competes according to them. Because if not, there's disqualification. Like when I was younger, I used to play a lot of like t-ball and baseball up at Shoreline Park. And there was a season, it was brief, but there was a season where I wasn't bad at it. I was good at it. And I remember I could hit, not all, but I could hit triples or, you know, I knew where I wanted to place the ball over that, you know, left, you know, what, whatever. But I had an issue. I would often crack the bat, see a hit, and then I'd sling the bat. Has anyone ever seen a kid do this? It's not advised. It's not something you want to be doing. And I remember the ump would often say, if you throw that bat, I'm going to call you out. I'd be like, okay, well, I wasn't doing it intentionally. But I'll never forget a game where I hit, and it was like, man, I, he even let me round all the way to third. <laughs> and I got the triple, and as soon as I got there, he goes, you're out. And I was like, what? He said, you slung the bat. Why do I say this? You know what I think matters most in ministry? And I don't just mean that for someone who works at a church. I mean, your life is ministry. Hopefully you know that by now as a believer, that what God's called you to do is to serve him by serving others and for his glory. You know what matters most in that? Character. Character is what matters most in ministry. If you're paying attention at all to the current pastoral landscape, it seems like God is shaking that tree of character and showing us that this is what I'm after. I'm after genuineness of heart. Paul says this, listen, in life, it's about the hope of heaven. It's about the rewards. It's like an athlete. It's like a farmer. It's like a soldier. Like a soldier, please your commander. Like an athlete, compete admirably. Don't throw the bats at people, right? Like a farmer, be patient. Be patient. Life for Paul was about heaven and a heavenly reward. And then he makes this massive statement that if you're, if you're a Christian, it's probably on a coffee cup or a t-shirt somewhere in your home. We walk by faith and not by sight. I mean, that's massive for us as believers, but it's almost parenthetical in the text. Like he's so enraptured with heaven, so enraptured with the, the reward of heaven. 
And he says, almost like, you know, we walk by faith, not by sight. I love what one author says about this. I wanted to put it up on the screen. He says, what sustained Paul was the realization that this was a temporary and transitory state, like the humidity of Northwest Florida. It will end. He focused not on the present, but the future conditions, not on the seen, but the unseen. To live this way is to live by faith, not by sight. It's to live in light of the ultimate rather than immediate realities, to be obedient to God's commands despite the hardship that obedience produces. Someone once shared with me, Neil, you know, one of the most challenging things we we encounter as human beings is often we exchange what we want most for what we just want in the moment. Like we don't keep that perspective of whatever it is that God's calling us to and we exchange what we want most for what we want in the moment. And this is what Paul says, my hope is heaven, the heavenly rewards. And because of that, You know, we live by faith, not by sight. We walk by faith because heaven is the ultimate and there's gonna be a reward ceremony that you don't wanna miss. And here's the key thing I wanna share this morning. It took me all that to simply say this. I believe we can position ourselves to hear God speak by simply trusting him. Trusting him, walking by faith, acting upon what God has already spoken, taking him at his word in confidence, and then living in light of his character and his faithfulness. You need to know God's character. He's not vindictive against you. He's not out to destroy you. Recognize that on the cross of Jesus Christ, Jesus fully satisfied the wrath of God against all sin on your behalf. God's not upset with you. He's not out to get you. So as you're making decisions, as you're impacted by decisions you've made, make your decisions based on the character of God. God's good. God's faithful. God's kind. God's loving. Faith is this simple trust in him. But faith that's not an action is not faith at all. Faith is evidenced through our life. See, that's what we see in Hebrews chapter 11. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn there with me, if you would, Hebrews chapter 11. If you're there, let me know by saying, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. Hebrews chapter 11. It's this great illustration, almost like this hall of fame, hall of faith of those who not just knew God, but lived in a way that evidenced that they knew God with their lives, simply doing what he called them to do. And I want to just highlight a couple of examples. Look at verse 7 of Hebrews chapter 11. We read about Noah. Verse 7, it says it was by faith that Noah built a large boat to save his family from the flood. He obeyed God, who warned him about the things that had never happened before. By faith, Noah condemned the rest of the world and received the righteousness that comes by faith. Think of Abraham with Isaac. Look at verse 17, where the author of Hebrews says this, it was by faith, that Abraham offered Isaac as a sacrifice when God was testing him. Abraham, who had received God's promises, was ready to sacrifice his only son, Isaac. Set yourself in the sandals of Abraham. He had no descendants, no legitimate descendants at all. And God had given this promise, you're gonna have a son. And Isaac at the time in which God asked of this sacrifice was probably around 30 years old. Finally, God, the promise has been fulfilled. And he says, I want you to give him to me. That's what he says in verse 18. Even though he had said, Isaac is the son through whom your descendants will be counted. 
Abraham trusted God. Think of Moses, verse 24. Look there with me if you would. He says, it's by faith that Moses, when he grew up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to share the oppression of God's people instead of enjoying the fleeting pleasures of sin. He thought it was better to suffer for the sake of Christ than to own the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking ahead to his great reward. It was by faith that Moses left the land of Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He kept right on going because he kept his eyes on the one who is invisible. It was by faith that Moses commanded the people of Israel to keep the Passover and to sprinkle the blood on the doorpost so that the angel of death would not kill the firstborn sons. By faith, by faith, by faith. Trusting God, evidenced through the ABCs, attitudes, beliefs, and choices. But did you catch the description of these men who made these choices of faith? They were looking ahead. Their framework was heaven, following him. Now, I want to read a bit of Bible to you. I'm going to read verses 32 through 38 of Hebrews chapter 11, because it gives this description of those who walk by faith, and I love it because it's honest. Look at verse 32, where the writer says this, after he's giving all these examples of those who trust God by walking with him. He says, how much more do I need to say? It would take too long to recount the stories of faith of Gideon and Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and all the prophets. By faith, these people overthrew kingdoms, ruled with justice, received what God had promised them. They shut the mouths of lions. Does anyone know who that would have been? Starts with a D, ends with an L. Daniel, yes, front row people. Absolutely, that's right, Daniel. Quenched the flames of fire, escaped death by the edge of the sword. Their weakness was turned to strength. They became strong in battle and put whole armies to flight. Women received their loved ones back again from the dead. Like, wow, so if I just walk by faith, everything just flourishes this side of eternity. Keep reading. Others were tortured, refusing to turn from God in order to be set free. They placed their hope in a better life after the resurrection. Let me share that again. Their hope was in a better life after the resurrection. Some were jeered at, their backs were cut open with whips, others were chained in prisons, some died by stoning. Some were sawed in half, others were killed with the sword. Some went about wearing skins of sheep and goats, destitute and oppressed and mistreated. They were too good for this world. Like if you heard that description, that wouldn't be the one that I would give. Well, that's what happened with their life. They're too good for this world. But from the perspective of heaven, let me just read this. Wandering over deserts and mountains, hiding in caves and holes in the ground. In some of the lives of those who walked with the Lord by faith, Miraculous things were done on this side of eternity. Others never received the promise of eternity on this side of eternity, but did completely in full eternity. As the writer of Hebrews says, the world, the world was not worthy of these people. I love the honesty of that from God's word. Because this is not the message. Man, if you just have faith and trust God, everything flourishes for you. That account is just gonna start to rise in Jesus' name toward the black. Maybe that could happen on this side of eternity. That if you just trust him with what's going on with your kids, they're just gonna turn around. It'll happen. Possibly that could happen. But from the perspective of eternity, for that which God is doing in the grand scheme of things, from that lens, from that framework of heaven and a reward, God is working together all things for good. Was anyone here the last couple of months when we walked through the book of Revelation? 
Does anyone remember what maybe some of those angels and creatures and elders were saying when they saw God in his majesty and saw things from his perspective? They said, you missed it. You blew it right here. You weren't faithful over there. Does anyone remember what they said three times? Holy, holy, holy. What does that mean? Well, one of the things that it means is that they said it three times to indicate how imperatively they were impressed with how well God does things perfectly. Three times. Holy, holy, holy. God, you have done all things well and right. From which perspective? From the heavenly perspective. At the end, to see the beginning from the end, the end from the beginning is seen only through God's eyes. And here's the thing that I want to share with you this morning, this summer. It's in a lifestyle of faith, acting upon what God has spoken in his word, taking him at his word in confidence regarding the direction of our lives, our relationships, our resources, and being confident as Paul was in the reality of heaven and that the rewards are real. It's in a lifestyle of faith that we position ourselves to be in that place where we're hearing from God and living a life that matters for now and eternity. One book, if you're a person that looks to pick up books throughout the summer that I'd highly recommend, I think it's a great book, by Jim Cimbala, Fresh Wind, Fresh Fire. He says this, true Christianity is to know Jesus and to trust him, to trust him, to rely on him, to admit that all our strength comes from him. That kind of faith not, not only is what pleases God, but it is also the only channel through which the power of God flows into our lives so we can live victoriously for him. It's what Paul meant when he wrote, I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Trust. To simply trust God. That he knows what he's doing. You see, ultimately, what God desires with us and from us is not our strength, not our resiliency, not our ability to endure. What is he looking for? I trust you, Dad. That what you're doing, you know all things. Holy, 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 I trust you. You know, I have this vantage point in this season of my life to have teenagers and toddlers, so to speak. That's a powerful vantage point. Let me just share that. But. And it's interesting, as I, as I know each of my kids in this season of life and seeing their different trust factors. How for some of them, especially those that are maybe under that age of six or so, that if I say, hey kids, this is what we're gonna do, there's like no question. Dad's gonna come through. He's faithful. We're gonna have an awesome time. And this for my son, Leonidas, this is his jam right now. Every, I don't know if you've ever done something once with your kid and they expect that every other day is gonna look exactly like that day when you did it once. But one time we took him to the shop, got him a special drink. We had Ollie, the golden doodle with us. We, we took him to the skate park. We went to the, the trails and Leonidas loves this little ba balance bike where he can just act like he's on a cruiser and he's cruising through the trails, cruising through the skate park. He's got Ollie, he's got this Oreo shake from the shop. He's living his best life at three years old. And every single day, he's, Dad, we going to the shop? Well, maybe. And then we're going to go to the skate park, and then we're going to take an ollie, and then we're going to go to the trails. I don't know. So it's, have you seen how humid it is out there? Like, why do I say all that? Leonidas trusts. He doesn't think about all the different dynamics going on in the world in which we live in. Hey, Dad's here. We're going to the shop today. We're doing this. We're doing that. That's an oversimplification, but of this simple truth. Listen, God is your good father. You want to hear from him? You want to live a life that's wor like worth something at the end of the day? Just trust him. Trust him. I don't know how many times in my life I've faced something and go, man, I don't know how this is going to work. And as time goes by, I say, oh God, that's what you were doing in that season. That's what you were developing or that's what you were, I had no idea. 
You were doing this over here or developing that over there. Maybe if I saw things from your vantage point, I'd go, man, you're holy, holy, holy. Don't waste your life with worry. Don't spend all of your days fretting. You remember Matthew chapter six? Let's turn there real quickly if we can. Matthew chapter six. These words are important. You know they are because they're in red. But Jesus says this. He's giving this amazing message called the Sermon on the Mount. He's teaching about so many different things, but at the end of chapter six, he's talking about money and possessions, talking about storing up your treasures in heaven, not on earth. But he says this, verse 25. This is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. Whether you have enough food or drink or enough clothes to wear, isn't life more than food, your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns, for your heavenly Father feeds them, takes them to the shop. And aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? I worry about clothing. Look at the lilies of the field, how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing, yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for the wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly take care of you. Why do you have so little faith? Don't worry about these things, saying what will we eat or drink or wear. These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers, but your heavenly Father already knows your needs. So what do we do? Seek the kingdom. Above all else, live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. Do you ever struggle hearing God speak? I would just simply ask you and call you back to something which is so simple. Just trust. Live a lifestyle of faith that God loves you, he cares for you, that he is the creator, and what he's looking for simply is a relationship with you where you just say, Dad, I trust you, that what you're doing, you're working all things together. It's a lifestyle of faith. See, it's not his gifts or his promises that truly fulfill our souls, but it's the very presence and person of God. And faith, Trusting him. It kind of EQs that dial to where you can receive and hear and enjoy his presence. And I just want to close this morning with this simple question. Man, are you in a place where you're just simply trusting him? Trusting him. Allowing him to lead, direct, and guide your life. Are, are you seeing life through this framework? the hope of heaven and the heavenly reward. I wanna share with you, I think it's getting increasingly more challenging to see life through that framework in the world that we live in. There's so many things pulling at us and so many things defining for us what a successful, well-lived life looks like. And I would say to us as Christians, as believers, without that simple perspective shaping our morning, afternoon, and evening, it's about heaven. It's about living a life like an athlete, like a farmer, like a soldier. That's where I'm headed. I'm here to please him. There's so many things pulling. To live life well is to simply be placed in a place in your heart where you're trusting him and have faith in him. Hearing God speak is so simple. It's trusting him. James, anything God says, do it. Follow him. Look at these examples from Hebrews chapter 11. Are you trusting him? Are you leaning into that trust in the aspects of your life? I want to encourage you, if not, take some time today to pray with one of the team members that will be up front, with your spouse, with a friend, about taking that next step wherever you are in your journey with him. If you don't yet know him, wherever, that, wherever you are, and simply trust 
him and live a lifestyle of faith. For that is the place that positions your heart to hear from him and to enjoy him both now and forever.